Kevin, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Overseas Development Institute in particular for hosting today's event. Um, thank you to the Guardian and Absentia, um, particularly to our colleagues at the FIA Foundation, Saul, uh, Avi, thank you very much for helping arrange this event. And to my colleagues uh, on the team from IHME, John Hopkins and Aaron representing a consortium of members from our emissions team. What fundamentally is this report about that we're launching today? Um, well, essentially, this is a, a checkup from the doctor, from the general practitioner, on a particular aspect of our planetary health. And this is a report that provides some recommendations on how we might improve our health. How did we get to this point? Well, really, from my perspective, in 2004, particularly from road traffic injury perspective, uh, the World Report on Road Traffic Injury Prevention was launched by the World Health Organization and the World Bank. And right around that time, there were a number of UN and World Health Assembly resolutions talking about the growing crisis of road safety in developing countries. Um, in 2006, my program, the Global Road Safety Facility, which is a grant-making organization within the World Bank, designed to scale up scientific and managerial capacity in low- and middle-income countries around road traffic, was launched. Um, we've had a bit of an interesting period since 2006. There were a few milestone events. There was the 2009 first ever global ministerial conference on road safety, a very important event because it attracted about 120 countries and around 90 development ministers. And that helped in turn launch what we know as the UN Decade of Action for Road Safety 2011 to 2020 and its affiliated goals of saving 5 million lives and preventing 50 million serious injuries. And where are we heading in that decade in 2015? There's going to be a midterm review and another global ministerial meeting. And next week in New York, they'll pass another UN resolution, which will talk about the host country for that event. But for purposes of our, of our report, in 2012 and 2013, the Global Burden of Disease team through IHME released the latest GBD findings and this is a very important uh, milestone because although there'll be continual updates, and we'll hear a little bit about that of GBD, it had been about, uh, I think, about six or seven years since the last GBD update. Um, a lot is happening in the world of road safety and emissions and how the international community is thinking and reacting to the global crisis, um, post-Rio world, plus, post-Rio plus 20, and around 2015, and the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. We're trying to look for a world that's trying to ensure a better future for, deal for generations dealing with an increasingly urbanized world and a rapidly motorizing world. So you hear a number of variations on safe, clean, and green as themes. And this essentially acknowledges the importance of transport services in development in terms of connectivity, particularly for low and middle income countries, connecting markets, access to healthcare facilities, educational opportunities, access to rural uh, medical care, facilitating better nutrition. Yet, rapidly motorizing transport may bring consequences to the population which are now understood as part of our world burden. And so perhaps the ultimate issue that we're facing, particularly from the development community, is how to transfer knowledge to act to combat this. So we began discussing with the IHME team on doing something new, using the GBD methodology to produce a snapshot of global health around motorized transport, which has not been done to date. And we brought together a team comprised of road safety experts, emissions, injury metrics, and other specialists to put together what we hope is a useful report that not only includes our understanding of the current statistics around the impact of motorized road transport, but also recommendations to assist those working in this field. So I'd like to touch upon the broad highlights of the findings, and my colleagues will be discussing a bit more about the science and the results. What we have found is motorized road transport, particularly around injuries and pollution from vehicles, imposes a large burden on population health resulting in more than 1.5 million deaths and nearly 80 million healthy years uh, of life lost annually. Of these, approximately 1.33 million deaths are as a result of road crash injuries and about 185,000 from pollution from vehicles. Death from road transport, as we've defined it, 
exceeds those from HIV, tuberculosis, or malaria, and contributes to six of the top 10 causes of death globally. We have confirmed that the health loss from road transport is substantial in all regions. The death from road injuries, shown in blue on the chart, are a dominant force in poorer regions, such as sub-Saharan Africa, where approximately 99% of the health loss is attributable to crashes. Well, the health loss from pollution, of course, tends to be highest among the wealthier regions, such as Western Europe, which clocks in around 44%. But indeed, it is injuries from road crashes and the resulting consequences that are responsible for most of the burden of motorized road transport, accounting for 95% of global healthy life years lost, truly reaffirming that road crashes are a crisis of the here and now. And of course, we know that about 90% of global crashes help happen in developing countries. Road crash burdens are also growing up in the last two decades by about 46%, with air pollution in total up 11%. Road injuries impose a, are imposing a top 10 cause of death in the first year of life through age 59, and are the fourth leading cause of death among women age 15 to 29 years old. This is to differentiate it slightly from the fact that road injuries are frequently reported as a male problem. Of course, it is one of the leading causes of death among male drivers, particularly younger ones in the age 15 to 39 category. But indeed, road injuries are among the top three causes of death for women in 17 of the 22 global burden and disease regions. Moreover, underreporting is a major problem. Major underreporting occurs based on the GBT findings up to two times as reported by some middle income countries and up to six times so low, some low income countries. And this is going to be examined in depth here today. So from these findings, we have proposed four broad policy areas to discuss with regard to motorized road transport at a time where the GBD 2010 um, results, again released last year, has confirmed that the contribution of risk factors has shifted globally from those that cause communicable diseases, such as neonatal and nutritional disorders, to non-communicable diseases and injuries. Our recommendations are as follows. One, rapidly scale up road safety programs and crash reporting capacity to save lives and promote economic development. Again, quite simply, road injuries are a major contributor to the global burden of disease and a substantial effort needs to be made given the global underreporting levels. Low and in middle income countries need to be able to take up this issue more accurately, and that means an ability to target information, interventions based on correct data. Now we have some examples in places like Latin America where the World Bank has helped open up a global, a, a regional data observatory based on an OECD standard. And we hope to replicate this in other world regions. But again, this monitoring and evaluation function, particularly around the data, is critical to underpinning domestic policy and international aid, as well as to ensure proper project design to assist scaling up sustainability. Two, and what I consider perhaps the most important personally, promote strong institutional development for multi-sectoral collaboration in the emerging development era of safe and clean mobility. Quite simply, what vision do we wish to achieve? What is our target here? Countries that have robust results-focused capacity where road crashes are actively managed across the board in what we call the safe system approach. Urban centers with infrastructure that encourage walking and ensure pedestrian safety and cycling. Enforceable regulations on vehicle safety and fuel quality. Are we moving to ensure that transit systems are part of the picture promoting health and development. For low and middle income countries in particular, part of our development challenge is again the effective transfer of knowledge and how to do it holistically in what is a very complex environment. This absolutely requires a much stronger link between sectors, between health, between transport, between the urban sector. It means multi-sectoral frameworks 
both for development agencies and for countries that lead to projects and an agreement on investment in a logical and sequenced way so that countries have a pathway to success that isn't piecemeal. This is really not easily achieved. Too often, countries may be sold on the idea, again, if you're taking the example of road safety, of edu education or singular risk factors being a panacea for real, lasting change. And we simply have not found this. The future really is about this holistic approach. And we've begun to create examples for these projects, particularly through some World Bank projects, in developing world, in places like Argentina, Colombia, India, and elsewhere. So in short, what we have perceived of as short-term action plans for countries prepared without designated lead agencies, for example, that are well-funded and mandated to lead the implementation of interventions are likely to remain paper plans with no lasting impact on results. And final two, commit the resources needed to realize the health and economic gains, gains from a safe and clean transport system. One to three percent GDP loss on average, up to eight to 10 percent for certain low and middle income countries. The numbers are being refined for motorized road transport, uh, but the burden it has is clear. The financial case for investing in safe and clean transport is strong. Safe infrastructure, vehicle safety, robust enforcement, emissions control technologies, fuel pollutant standards. These are among some of the aspects that will have to be tackled in a post-Rio world and a 2015 sustainable development and sustainable transport world. And finally, systematically account for the health impacts of road projects. Quite simply, we're very weak in this area. Understanding of road transport pollutants in targeted geographic areas, how roading projects in impact safety, how transport projects affect physical activity, particularly for low and middle income countries, we are at a point where much more attention needs to be given to this area to ensure that the complex causal pathways are understood in regard to impacting human health. And indeed, really development projects are at their core about improving human health and well-being and the ultimate goal of development need not be viewed uh, as a with transport as a negative externality, but part of a holistic objective in promoting productive lives. And that's perhaps what we mean most by transport for health. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Um, before passing, so we, we've changed the order slightly. I'm going to go to Katie next. But Mark, bef before I do that, can I just ask you, uh, you know, I mean, uh, th I think the evidence on this has become increasingly compelling over the years. You mm. know, there's, there's a very powerful cost-benefit case for action on, on road safety. But to what extent do you think that, ca that is really reflected in the multilateral institutions in approaches to project planning? Mm. I mean, are we seeing benchmarking for road safety indicators brought into projects across the multilateral system? Yes, well, I mean, across the multilateral system, as you know from your research, Kevin, this is, um, there's, ex there's a variety of different uh, indicators and sort of project design um, implementation uh, that goes in around the road safety angle. I can only tell you from the perspective of the World Bank, uh, we are perhaps further along than we ever have been about ensuring that road safety indicators are discussed uh, both within project planning within, within the World Bank, but most importantly with the client. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, as you know, uh, we reflect a little bit of what the government wishes are for some of these projects. But it, our job as one of the leading development organizations is to ensure that our clients have the most up-to-date information about how best to promote safe and clean mobility. And so from the bank side, we are ensuring that all road transport projects that go through our transport sector board are, have been looked at from a road safety angle. Uh, we started a staff certification program for transport staff around so road safety, which to my knowledge is the first among the development banks to do that. And ultimately at the end of the day, from 2006, since we launched the first global fund to help countries build scientific and managerial capacity in the global road safety facility, we've seen a tremendous leverage effect from the type of catalytic funding that we're able to give to countries to incentivize them to build this in. Uh, to build road safety into the project. Okay, thank you. Um, so one glitch in my introduction, the, the other speakers have five minutes each, not, not 10 minutes each. So Katie, over to you.